All right, recording should be going. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about the lift motion prediction competition that I've been working on for the past three months. I know some of the other people on the call have also been working on this. Um, so hopefully we can have some discussion about what people came up with and I'll, I'll kind of give a broad overview of what the task was and, and what we were working on and what I think most people tried. Um, but then after that, we can have more open discussion and just say what people did. Um, me personally, I'm Ryan Chesler. I'm a data scientist at H2O working on auto machine learning and, and various different things. Um, so just a little bit about the group before we get into the actual presentation. Um, this is a San Diego machine learning group. We meet twice on Saturday. So we actually typically have two sessions. The first session is typically a book club of some sort. So we just finished deep learning with PyTorch. We're about to go into um, designing data intensive applications. Um, that one's starting next week, I believe. Um, and then our second session is typically um, working on Kaggle competitions or doing some other sort of project collaboration. The way we run that, it's kind of just like office hours where people just kind of hang out. And if you have a problem that you want to discuss and have people help you with, then we're available and we just kind of collaborate on whatever we're doing. Um, and so um, we also have various other talks. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a talk on rapid minor. We have um, talks in the future on neuroscience and various other things. So if you're interested in those, you can come by and just hear a little bit on various different topics. Um, everything's on the media page. Um, so if you're ever wondering what's going on, you can check out on the meetup page what, what's in the docket. Um, and all of our slides and notes and videos are typically posted on GitHub. Um, I've been doing a bad job of forwarding those to Ted and getting those on there, but I'll, I'll catch up someday and then we'll have everything filled in. Um, and then we also have a Slack channel that's somewhat active. So if you ever, um, want to join that, that's also on the meetup page and you can just come in there and people chat and discuss various different things on there. Um, so that's it for San Diego machine learning. And then I'll get into discussing the lift competition. Um, and so basically the idea of this whole competition was we're trying to predict the next five seconds of movement for all of the surrounding cars. So we have this self-driving vehicle and then we want to predict all of the surrounding vehicles for the next five seconds. And we're predicting that as, at a resolution of 0.1 seconds. So you're saying for the next 50 time steps, what are the X, Y coordinates of the vehicle? Um, and this is useful because if you have a self-driving vehicle, one of the typical things that a human driver would do is they would say, oh, it looks like this car is about to get in front of me or they're about to turn right or they're about to stop or something like that. Um, and so this is useful for a self-driving car because it helps you do additional planning. So you can say, I think they're going to cut in front of me, so I should probably start breaking or something like that. Um, and then on top of that, instead of just predicting trajectories, we can predict multiple trajectories and we can also assign um, the different trajectories, different confidence. So you can say, I think there's a 60% chance they're gonna turn left 30% chance they're gonna go straight and a 0.1 chance they're gonna go right or stop or something like that. Um, so that's kind of the gist of the competition that we were working on. And then the data we had, we had about a thousand hours worth of data that was collected by the Lyft self-driving cars. Um, and this was across a fairly small um, set of rows. So if you look at the map in the bottom left, it's um, fairly limited. It's not like we're trying to solve this problem for the entire US, it's just a very small region of um, Palo Alto. Um, and so how this data was actually labeled is they have their um, perception system and this perception system is taking in the sensory data that's captured by the, um, hang on, let the leaf blower go past for a second. <laughs> So the um, sensory data is captured and then it's passed to the lift perception system and that lift perception system will capture the um, vehicle position. So it's basically saying the LIDAR and the camera and whatever other sensors they have 
can create this representation that's saying there's a car over here, there's a car over there, there's a um, pedestrian in this location, and then its output is a bird's eye view image. So if you look in the bottom left corner, that ends up turning into something like this, um, where we say there's a car over here and they're going this way and, and we know the history of their trajectory basically. Um, and if you want more detail on that, you can look at the um, paper directly from Lyft. It's available on archive. Um, and so digging in a little bit further on the data, um, we have the history of the vehicle that we're forecasting as one of our kind of channels of um, data. And then the other one is the history of the surrounding vehicles. And so that's, that's what um, these first six points are it's showing here's all of the surrounding vehicles, here's the vehicle we're actually interested in trying to forecast for, and then we also have some data from the semantic maps that's telling us various things about the states of the traffic lights and the crosswalks um, and the lane lines. Um, and so we also have information um, from satellite maps, but it seems like people didn't use those a whole ton, so it's probably not worth talking about too much. And so this is what our outputs might look like. So the blue trajectory is the ground truth. And then here are three different paths that my model outputs. So you can see that it thinks it might have gone forward a little bit or even more or even more than that. Um, but the true answer was actually to turn left a little bit. Um, so that's roughly what our output and our target would look like. Um, so with this data, we had basically two major files that were provided to us, train and train full. And the train full is just a much larger file of the training set. And these came in the form of ZAR files. They're kind of similar to HDF5. It's kind of just a wrapper on top of that. Um, I don't remember if I gave it to this group, but I gave a talk a while ago on HDF5. Um, pretty useful format. So that's what they used here. Um, and the way that most people access the data was through the L5 kit directly from Lyft. Um, it's on GitHub. You can check it out and see what it's doing. Um, but basically, the gist of it is it's loading in the data in a format that's prepared for actually making predictions. Um, and so the, the way that they've configured the data, it's very flexible, but it also requires um, decompressing out of the ZAR files, and it also requires some rasterization. Um, and that was a huge bottleneck that a lot of people ran into. Um, so what, what people were joking about is you just always have your CPU at full tilt and then your GPUs at like 5% utilization or, or flickering on and off between 0% and 50% um, because we couldn't um, pull the data in fast enough in order to keep the GPUs fed. Um, so that was one of the major issues that people ran into. Um, and then in terms of the methods, there's a lot of different ways that you could pose this problem. Um, so there's the possibility of unimodal, basically saying, let's just output a single path. So here's the x, y coordinates that we think are the most likely for the car in the next 50 time steps. Or you can do multimodal, which is basically saying, I think these three different paths might be likely. And this is really useful for um, the self-driving scenario because um, we don't necessarily know the intent of all of the surrounding vehicles. They might intend to turn right or go straight at a certain scenario, and there's no way for us to know that, so we just have to kind of reason about the probability of things. Um, and then there's also various different avenues in terms of classification, um, and so I don't think anyone used it for this competition, but you could do something like an occupancy map where you basically split um, the image into a grid, and then you say, here are the um, points that I think that the, um, that the car might occupy throughout its trajectory. So you can say, I think this grid area is more likely for the car to pass through. Um, and then another option is to use some sort of pre-generated trajectories. So there's not actually that many movements that a car can do across five seconds. Um, it doesn't have a ton of degrees of freedom. It can basically accelerate, decelerate, and then turn a little bit. And so there's a very limited number of actions that it can actually take across 50 seconds or five seconds, um, 50 time steps. And so what you can do is you can basically say, here's a set of likely trajectories 
Um, and then just pick the one that you think is the most likely and is close to the reality. Um, I see the chat moving. If anyone has any questions or anything, feel free to um, just shout it out or chime in because um, I don't have the chat open right now. So, so uh, Ryan, I'll let you know if there are any uh, questions, like if somebody doesn't have a microphone, but I did have a quick question. Mm -hmm. On the previous slide, we talked about an occupancy map. Is that a little bit like in particle physics where you have like a probability density function where you say like there's a certain chance, I think that the car will be in this pixel versus a certain chance in that pixel or something like that? Um, I don't know enough about physics to say for certain, but it sounds similar, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, it's definitely a probability density function. And so, and, and they definitely use it to track particles. Mm -hmm. Let me take a second to open chat just in case. Um, and so there are various different models that people might use. Um, the primary ones being convolutional neural networks. Um, and so one of the things that's going on here is we actually have history of information. So you might expect it to be temporal in some, in some form. So you might also apply recurrent neural networks or transformers or something like that. But what most people seem to have found um, success with is just directly using the convolutional neural networks. And um, it's a little bit confusing because typically with images, you might think that you have your normal red, green, blue channel. Um, but in this case, we actually have channels for, um, here's one channel for the surrounding vehicles and here's the channel for the surrounding vehicles a tenth of a second ago and two tenths of a second ago, and then a separate channel for um, the um, the vehicle we're making a prediction for and its history and, and so on. And what you basically do is you stack all of those channels together and you're not really representing the, um, the temporal nature of the data. You're just kind of giving them all to the various different channels and then hoping that it finds the interactions in them. Um, and so that's what most people found success and it turned out to not really be super um, beneficial to use recurrent neural networks or transformers or anything like that. Um, and then another avenue that I saw a lot in the literature um, was using generative adversarial networks. And so at the beginning, I looked at that and I said, I don't really understand how these are relevant. Um, and then I dug in and ended up making an implementation of that. And the idea there is basically you have one model that is trying to generate realistic trajectories and then another one that's trying to figure out, is this a real trajectory um, or a generated one? Um, and so then you play this game where it's trying to generate more and more realistic trajectories. And in the literature, a lot of people found success in this because um, in, in the normal convolutional neural network approach, every time you get a certain input, its output is going to be the same. It's completely deterministic. So if you want to generate additional paths, you have no way to really do that. And what the generative adversarial network does is since it has some noise input to it as well, you can basic, basically make it say, okay, keep generating more paths until you get one I like, um, and you can get more variation out of those potentially. Um, but I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, and so some of the major problems um, that we came across in this challenge, and you'll see this a lot in the literature if you took around a little bit, is mode collapse. So we have the opportunity to predict three different trajectories, um, but what might happen is all of the trajectories end up being very similar. So if you, if you um, have three different paths and they all just say varying amounts of going straight, that's not really that interesting. You typically want it to um, go across the actual variation. So if there's a possibility of turning right, you want it to um, model that in some way. Um, and then there's also the problem of when you're trying to combine predictions. So a lot of people um, in Kaggle competitions, you typically take a lot of models and then you average them together in some way. And then the, the combined knowledge of multiple models is going to end up with better predictions than just a single model. Um, but in this competition, it was a little bit tricky because you might end up with um, 
varying different predictions out of your different trajectories. So if you average a trajectory that's going left and a trajectory that's going right, eventually they're all going to end up kind of just looking like a, a straight line. It, it's kind of like when you mix paint and then eventually everything just becomes brown. Um, so that, that was one of the major issues that we had to overcome is, is getting some variety in our predictions rather than just variations on the same one. Um, one of the other errors or, or the one of the other issues is the error was extremely top heavy. So we have a lot of scenarios where the car doesn't move very much or is doing something very predictable and we can get very good results out of that. But then the problem is we have a very tiny percent that is causing a huge amount of the error. So I, I was consistently looking at the, the sorted percentiles of the error and looking at the top 1% of my error, it was actually contributing to 35% of the overall. So there's a very limited number of scenarios that are difficult to model and, and had to be optimized for basically. Um, and I was looking at it as kind of two separate problems. One of them is generating good paths and then the second one is actually picking out of those paths which ones are the correct ones. Um, and so looking at the right over here, um, this is kind of how I was looking at the input. So I just have the history of the surrounding vehicles, the history of the vehicle I was making a prediction for, and then the semantic map. Um, and one of the first things I noticed was of this top 1%, almost all of the samples were coming from ones where the history was missing in some form. So this is the target vehicle. And it turns out that three of the um, six history points are missing. And so what I ended up doing is um, trying to reformat the data in order to um, address that in some way. So now um, moving on to what I worked, what I found was successful throughout working on the, on the problem and then also reading through all of the different forum posts. Um, one of the most important things, this is true of almost every type of competition, is finding proper validation. Um, and so I think I hit the second point here, but not necessarily the first. Um, and the, the major thing here was making sure that the training data looks similar to the validation data, which looks similar to the test data. Um, and so in this case, we had some settings that you could fiddle with in terms of how much um, history and how much um, future you could see in order to um, make, make predictions. So if you took a sample and you had no history of it, or if you had a future and there were only five available points, um, then it might end up slightly different than if you were making predictions and you had 50 future time steps. Um, and so making sure that those two match turned out to be very important for this conversation. Um, at the end, after reading everyone's discussion, I ended up just tweaking one of the parameters and it showed that I could go from 16.8 loss down to under 13, just by changing one parameter and training a little bit extra. Um, so that ended up turning out to be very important. Um, and then the second piece of proper validation is mimicking the data prep that was um, used to create the test set. So they used this chopping procedure on the test set and it was important to also apply that to the validation set in order to make sure that you're um, operating on something that's similar. And so once I chopped the validation set and then looked at, at the two side by side, there was almost no variation. So at that point, I didn't even really need to do submissions in order to check how I was doing because I could just look at my local validation and know that that was um, roughly in line with what, um, what I had locally. And so in terms of model, it turned out that the simple CNN baseline that was provided by Lyft from the start was reasonably good. You didn't really have to change a whole lot with that. Um, it, it took in the input that it needed to and it, it was in the right format to make the um, outputs what we needed to. Um, and some people made various different tweaks. I tried a lot of different variations on top of it, but I didn't ultimately find anything that was um, really stellar in comparison. So I think that what, what they provided was fairly good. Um, hey, Ryan. 
Yeah, we have a question. Um, do you have a slide where you talk about the loss function or do you want to just verbally talk about that? Um, yeah, so that that's kind of this bullet point. So my loss function turned out to just directly be the competition metric. So we were given um, the competition metric just directly from the competition hosts. Um, one of the people in the competition ended up um, converting it from NumPy to PyTorch, and then we can just directly say optimize for this. Um, and I, I don't have the formula written anywhere, but the, the gist of it is you want to have one trajectory that is close to reality, and then you want your, your confidence to be weighted towards the correct trajectory. Um, but ultimately, the most important thing is having at least one trajectory that is close to the truth. That, that is the um, ultimate way to get close to a, a good score. Um, um, and then one of the one of the other important things is just lots of training. Um, that was something that I think I kind of fell short on. I, I would train for about 24 hours or something like that. And then I would see that the results were kind of plateauing out and then I would just kill it. Um, but after reading the forums and seeing what other people were saying, I needed to just continue training a bit further because things continue to improve even if at a much slower rate. Um, and so one of the things is we also have 70 gigs of data in the train full. Um, and so the likelihood of even iterating through all of the available training data is pretty low unless you're running for just days and days and days. Um, so actually just training a long time and seeing lots of unique scenarios is pretty important. Um, and then in terms of ensembling, like I was saying, it wasn't that straightforward to actually just combine the raw outputs. So people had to do various different tricks. Um, one of the tricks that was proposed um, from Hang was you actually just, rather than take the, the final outputs, the trajectories, you output the, um, the embeddings from the CNN and you concatenate those across various different models. And then you train a new head that combines those features and then tries to generate new trajectories. Um, and that seemed to work fairly well. Um, it, it got a point or two of improvement from for many people. Um, and then another one that I used and, and several other people used is k-means. And so that's what I'm showing on the right side here. Um, I had predictions from many, many model checkpoints. So this is all from the same model. Um, it outputs a whole ton of trajectories because I have 20 models or something like that. And then you can just apply k-means on top of that and it will find the clusters out of those. And then you take the cluster centers and then it will output something that is um, reasonably diverse and, and summarizes what um, all of those other trajectories are showing. So this is, this is all of the outputs from the model trajectory and this is the three modes that it can derive out of here. Um, and it turns out to, to be, be a fairly good um, summarization of that. Um, the first thing I looked at was the Gaussian mixture models um, directly from sklearn. Um, and those did well, but they took significantly more compute time. And so eventually I switched to k-means and I compared the results of the two. And ultimately there, there was no real difference between them. It might've been a small fraction of a point in, in favor of the k-means actually. Um, and so one of the other tricks I used was um, checkpoint averaging. So if I have a model and I train it for um, 20 epochs, I might take the last five of those and just average across all of those. And it, it gets a fairly good result. Um, and then um, addressing from the previous slide, I had some inputs and I was seeing that a lot of the high error ones were from ones that were missing history. And so what I did is I created this augmentation where I would just basically cut off the history at various different points. Um, so if I originally had it set up to have um, five history points, then I would just cut it off and say, now you only get one history point. So now you have to um, make inference from less history, basically. Um, 
And another one of the important things is normalizing the orientation. So originally in the competition, we were given these trajectories that were in reference to the way that the car was actually facing. So we have our car and then there's another car across the street or something like that. And it's facing at a diagonal. And then the trajectory is going in some random direction. Um, and what ended up being useful is always aligning it so the car is just going to the right across the screen. Um, that was very helpful in um, improving convergence and also improving the final result. Um, and so- Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a quick question. Would you mind sharing what mix of Kaggle notebooks, local and cloud uh, compute you used for training? Yeah, so I, I have my own system um, at home. I have a, a workstation with very old dual Xeons and a couple 1080 Ti's. Um, and so that was what I originally started the competition on. And then things were just taking a very long time and I wasn't able to iterate very fast. So eventually I ended, I ended up renting out a system from vast.ai. Um, and they're basically a cloud provider that that sells it, it's a marketplace for excess capacity from people's systems and so i was able to get a good deal um, on a system with two 2080 ti's and that allowed me to do more experiments across those and it was only about 50 cents an hour um, so i was fairly happy with what i was able to get for the money there um, yeah, so that, that was basically my compute setup. Um, and then moving on to what didn't work. Um, this is going to be the, the brunt of the presentation. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I tried adding additional non-image features. So we had various different things like the yaw and the history of the positions in terms of raw X, Y coordinates instead of the images um, and velocities and various different things that we could extract out of there. Um, and so I tried experiments with that and those are actually predictive. I trained models where I was just trying to predict using only those and those can get you reasonable performance actually, but it turned out to not be useful with the images also available. It seemed like the images were already able to capture that um, without anything else. Um, so did experiments with those, didn't really pan out. And then I also tried things with GANs, um, kind of just as an excuse to play with those. I didn't figure that they were going to be the most useful. But what I ended up finding was that the discriminator just always beat the generator. And basically, if I, if I didn't also add in the competition metric as an additional supervisor, it would just degrade. It wouldn't actually grow to make um, useful trajectories. Um, so I ended up canning that eventually. Um, and then one of the things that I picked up just to try it out basically was using some sort of segmentation model like a unit. I saw that um, on the external data thread, the team that was in first at one point was using the segmentation models package. And so I figured I would try to figure out if there was something useful that could be done with that. And so I did a unit that would simultaneously try to forecast a trajectory, but then also output a mask that maps the future position. So the target would look something like this, saying the car is going to go forward this amount, um, or it's going to turn or, or do whatever else. And then I'm going to output also the, um, the, the unit is going to try to predict this. Um, and it would be sort of an additional, um, signal for it to try to map to. Um, and that ended up not really yielding anything. Um, if anything, I think it seemed to make it so the model would try to converge to going straight even more often because it sort of laid down a prior to always predict these central pixels because those were the most likely. 
um, and it made it less likely for it to do various different turning motions. Um, and then the other thing that I tried that didn't work was extracting additional information from the um, L5 kit. And so one of the things that I was interested in was the traffic light histories. So if we look at the previous images, we have those three outputs for, for this sort of semantic map. And that's telling us the, um, the last known state of the traffic lights and the crosswalks and the lane lines and stuff like that. But um, one of the things I was noticing was a lot of the higher samples were coming from points where the car was starting from a complete dead stop. And so I was thinking maybe that's because it's not able to reason about when the light might change. And so I would give it some history of that. And then it could say, okay, the light has been red for the last five seconds or something like that. Maybe it's going to change soon. And then it would have some additional um, context there. But what, what ended up happening is it just really, really slowed down the, um, the, the data prep side um, and didn't seem to yield any better results. Um, and then later I did some other experiments that kind of showed that that, that layer of information might not actually be that important. Um, the other thing I extracted was the history of the position of all of the cars in the scene. So by default, we have the output of the history of just the car we're trying to um, predict. But what I did is I output the history of all of the cars in the scene, potentially just their raw X, Y coordinates, and then um, basically made that one big array that was also input to the network. But that also didn't seem to be that, that important. Um, and in some form, it's already captured in the images. So that, that makes sense why it wouldn't be necessary to have that in there. Um, the other thing that I tried extracting out of there was the classifications for each vehicle. So one of the things from the L5 kit um, is the label probability. So it's saying, is this a pedestrian? Is this a car? Is this a bus? Is this a cyclist, um, et cetera? There, there's, I think there was about 17 different classifications, but they only really exposed, I think, three or four of them to us. And then I looked at the data that was coming out of there and it looked like over 99% was just all cars anyways. And so it wasn't really that useful because it had such little variation. Um, the feature that I ended up feeding out of there was basically the sum of all of those probabilities. Um, and so that's kind of analogous to saying there's 40 cars on the road right now and three cyclists and one whatever else. Um, and so that was that was the format that I ended up taking there, and it didn't seem to really yield anything. And like the other ideas, it kind of just slowed down the data loading process. Um, and then the other thing I tried doing was um, LSTM for the inputs or the outputs. Um, so we do have some form of temporal data here, and so I tried reformatting things. So I was I was trying to represent that. But all it really did was slow the model down and it didn't seem to really yield anything. It still got good results, but it, it didn't seem any better to me. And it was so much slower to train. It didn't really seem worth it. Um, continuing on with the stuff that didn't work, um, I looked at various different methods um, from Waymo and Newtonomy. Um, and so they have this concept of cover net or multipath. And the idea is here is what, what most people did in this competition was regression. You're directly predicting the X, Y um, positions of the cars, but the cover net and multipath, what they're kind of proposing is making it sort of more of a classification where you say, here's possible trajectories, pitch, pick which one you think is closest to reality. Um, and then also potentially learn a correction on top of that. So if you say, I think it's going to be a turn right trajectory, and then on top of that, you have some regression output that learns um, some correction on top of that to make it even closer to reality. Um, and so I ended up doing an implementation of this and it worked reasonably well, um, but the, the problem is it's still fairly difficult to make a correct classification here. Um, so this is, this is the trajectories that my clustering came up with, and this was created by basically loading in a whole bunch of the training data's trajectories and then doing k-means on them 
in order to output the 64 different clustered um, trajectories. And so then what my model would do is out of these trajectories, pick one, which one's the closest and then also try to output um, some correction on top of it. And I train that for a while and it actually does very well on the um, bottom 95% of predictions, but then when it gets things wrong, it gets them very wrong. So the top 5% of error um, kind of blows up because if it picks entirely the wrong branch, then it's pointing completely to the wrong direction. Um, and then another thing I tried was resampling the data in various different ways. Um, so I noticed that the top percentile was just completely massive errors. And so I figured, what if I do something to make those high loss samples more prevalent? So they get shown more times and hopefully they get learned. Um, but that ended up not really yielding anything. And I think that the problem there is um, just because you're wrong in one way for one sample, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be generalized knowledge that's useful for other samples. Um, and so in the bottom left, I have this, um, this was kind of one of my diagnostics that I used throughout the competition and it's showing the percentile of the error, the mean error of that percentile, and then the percent of all error and the number of samples. And so you can see that the top um, 0.25 is very high, it's 739 error and it amounts to about 22% of the overall error. Um, and so if I could just do well on that tiny, tiny set of 236, it would greatly reduce my loss. And so that was something that I was trying to key in on is how do I um, mitigate these sort of catastrophic errors? Because the majority of the trajectories are actually pretty good. There's just a handful that are doing very poorly. Um, and so one of the more creative things that I tried doing is splitting the prediction space into thirds and then assigning a head to each one of those. So I basically took the percentiles of the X and Y coordinates of the trajectories and I said anything above um, 0.3 to the right or 0.3 to the left or a certain amount forward and a certain amount back, um, split those into different prediction heads and whenever a car goes to that spot, only train that head. And then in theory, I have um, actively assigned those heads to always go in different directions and then try to pick um, which one it thinks is the most likely. Um, and then in theory, when I try to actually do some ensembling, I know that this is my go right and forward head and this is my go left and forward head and this is my tight left turn head, um, for example. And then if I wanted to do an ensemble of them, they're already assigned the correct spot. So if I average them together, they will um, end up working together rather than kind of average out to that mode collapse scenario. Um, but what ended up happening is it just could not converge to a good solution. Um, in a lot of the scenarios, um, you might end up with something where there's three trajectories that are somewhat similar, but having all of them actually is a good solution. And in that scenario, you're forcing them all to be different. So you only basically have one ticket for each option. So you can't do very much variation within the different um, um, grid, grid spaces. Um, one of the other things I tried was separate models for each trajectory. So what most people did is they had a single model and it outputs three trajectories all out of that same model. And what I tried doing was um, maybe in order to induce more variation, I have each model just output one trajectory and then I kind of line them all up and evaluate that. And in theory, that might allow them to each specialize on different scenarios. But what ended up happening is because they couldn't actually share anything and they didn't know what the other one was going to output, it, it was actually even worse in terms of um, the variety. They would all kind of output a similar looking output and it ended up yielding worse loss. Um, and then in a different avenue, um, instead of outputting just three trajectories, which is what we were able to do for this metric, we could output 10 trajectories and then just pick the top three. And I tried this in various different forms with different um, 
different methods of picking the top three and optimizing for various different metrics. And it somewhat works, but not really. One of the big problems is if you have 10 outputs and then you're just picking the top three, it might turn out that your top three are just all variations on go straight or turn right or something like that. You need some way in order to pick um, a diverse bunch. And so I saw some people in the forum say that they were actually doing a like 2000 mode model and then they do K means on top of that and then um, do that reduction step that I was kind of talking about for ensembling for. Um, and then another thing um, I looked very early on in the competition is various different forms of image augmentation. Um, ultimately, I don't think it was that important because we already had so much data, we didn't really need to augment the scenarios. Um, but it's a little bit tricky to think about because most augmentations um, that people typically use, like you do a rotation or a flip or a um, slight blurring or color shift, or there, there's all kinds of different things that you can do with normal images. And a lot of them aren't actually valid for this scenario, because if you flip it, then it's all of a sudden like you're driving on the different side of the road or something like that. Or if you're rotating, then you have to rotate everything. And then it, it becomes a little bit more tricky to do that. Um, and so I tried various things there, but nothing really panned out. And I think it kind of makes sense when you have that much data, it doesn't, it's, it's not that important. Um, and then another thing I looked at was custom losses. And so I was thinking there might be some way to punish a model for outputting close paths. So if a model outputs all trajectories and the trajectories are close, then there might be some way to penalize that and force it to try to take different paths. Um, and so that was something I, I looked at writing some custom ones, but I never ultimately ended up getting anything to really succeed. There, there might be some configuration that's possible there, but I wasn't, I wasn't able to come up and come up with anything in that regard. Um, continuing on the train, train of everything that didn't work. Um, one of the things I noticed in my predictions when I was looking at my validation was um, small shifts in the pixels um, or, or in the alignment of things could completely change my prediction. So I took my very high error um, predictions. And then I just said, I'm just going to shift a single channel one pixel down. And then all of a sudden my model would magically know exactly the trajectory that it should have taken. And so I thought maybe there's some error that's introduced from the perception system. So the perception system might be off by half a meter on a car that's 30 meters away or something like that. And just kind of the noise from the perception system might be something that's throwing off my model because actually the car didn't move forward um, two meters in the last tenth of a second. It only moved one and a half meters, but the perception system isn't, doesn't have high enough resolution to really um, define those two things. And so what I did is one of the augmentations I tried is just randomly um, shifting the various channels by um, some amount up to three pixels on the various different channels. And what I found is that made my model robust to those sort of perturbations, but it didn't necessarily make it better overall. So then later when I went to the validation set and I did that same process of moving the, um, moving the channels around a little bit, it would make it so that the variation was much lower, but it didn't necessarily yield a better overall result. Um, and then one of the other things I was looking at was some form of frame differencing or optical flow um, those are fairly common techniques when we're dealing with motion. So you want to actually say like what changed between these two images, where, where was the motion heading? Um, and you can um, kind of extract out what is significant. And I've used this in previous self-driving applications. There's, there's this area of visual odometry, basically um, predicting your speed given the, the, the images that you see from out the front of the car. Um, and in, in that scenario, optical flow ended up being very important because it's showing you the, the motion across your frames and is able to extract that out of there. And I tried applying um, frame differencing, which is kind of a simplified form of that um, and ended up not really being that useful. Um, I, I think it just takes away too much information um, 
it still captures the the movement, but it kind of loses the the size of objects and stuff like that. Um, and so another thing I tried early on was the ResNet two plus one D, and this is a video classification model. You can take this straight out of the Py, Py, um, PyTorch Torch Vision package. And so this was trying to again take advantage of that. Um, we had both images, but we also had a temporal aspect. And so I was trying to treat them somewhat as a video. Um, and that's kind of the same as the other, other techniques I tried. It slowed things down, but it didn't yield better results. Um, the other thing was um, different model backbones. So drying out ResNet 18, ResNet 50, um, I benchmarked both of those, didn't really yield any benefit. I saw various different conversations in the um, discussion and it seemed like the consensus was the backbone isn't really super important in this um, in this scenario um, and then other things I tried were longer history so um, looking further back what the cars were doing and then looking at bigger images so um, we have a certain amount of surrounding context that we have um, and we could look even further than that. Um, and in, in, in my experiments, at least it didn't seem to be that important. I ended up having decent success with just 128 by 128 images. Um, I know some people did bigger, but I, it, it seemed to me like that was just slowing things down without actually getting better results. Um, and then the, the other thing I did trials of was using the satellite images rather than the semantic maps. So the semantic maps were those things with all of the lane lines and the track lights and that stuff. And then the satellite images is the, um, they, they just basically took the, the aerial satellite imagery and then they just return the cutout of that area. So you can see what the roads look like and, and the trees and all of that stuff. You have actually much more information there. Um, and the semantic maps, you just have exactly what is probably relevant to your car. Um, and so um, I, I had an interesting error that I came across when I swapped to the satellite images. Um, I, had the, I had a model that was trained on the semantic maps and I accidentally set something to the satellite images. Um, and then I did prediction with the wrong inputs into those channels. And it only hurt my inputs from 18 loss down to 25 which was kind of surprising to me because I thought the difference would actually be much more than that because in the past when I had input the wrong things, the loss would be in the hundreds or thousands. And it turns out that this was only in, in a single digit change, basically. Um, so conclusions and takeaways from this competition. Um, this has been a common theme with my stuff. I'm, I'm very into rapid prototyping and getting stuff done, um, but often at the at the cost of organization and keeping my code modular. I work in a lot of notebooks, and so I ran into issues when I was um, transferring between a notebook on one system and a notebook on another system, and then I would say, oh, I found this thing that works a little bit better. I'm going to apply that to all of my notebooks, and then I would have to go through and updated in every single one and then I had errors going back and forth between them. Um, so that's something that I still need to get better on. Um, at one point I had things break because on one system I had a certain version of the L5 kit and another version on the other one and I hadn't really taken into account that they would be different. I didn't realize that a new version had been rolled out. So for a while I had to kind of scratch my head and say, why is this breaking? I don't understand what's going on here. Um, and so that's another piece of kind of keeping organized and, and getting every all my ducks in the line. Um, and so an, another thing that that led to my, my poor organization, I would do an experiment here and do an, another experiment there. And I would say, oh, this one does a little bit better. And it would turn out that I just had an error somewhere. So one time I had an error where I, I, when I first moved to that new system on the, on the vast.ai servers, I just started on the train file instead of the train full. And then eventually that error kind of um, 
propagated back to other notebooks. So I was training on the train file and so that it's trained full. And, and then I was comparing results between the two. And I would say, oh, why is this all of a sudden doing worse than it was previously? And it was because I was training on a different file entirely. Um, so that's another thing we're just keeping organized and double checking my work was fairly important, um, especially when our iteration time was fairly slow. Um, and so I, I think one of the other things I learned is that we always need to find some way to get train and validation to closely relate to each other. Um, I, I looked at my old kernels and I saw what people were mentioning in the discussion forums after the competition and just changing the um, minimum history to a different value, it made the train and the validation much more closely aligned. And I, I found that I, I could go from 16.8 loss all the way down to 13 just by changing that parameter basically and making it optimized for something that was the same between the training and the validation. Um, so I think in, in future competitions, I'll have to hunt for that a little bit harder. Um, and then the other thing, um, I haven't done too many projects where I've had to train for such long extended periods. And so on this one, it, it seemed like I, quit training a little bit too early. So I would train for 24 hours and I would say it's basically maxed out. It doesn't seem like it's improving that much, but I think if I continue training even further, I would find that I, I continue to squeeze out slightly more out of it. Um, and then the other thing um, I think I need to work on is that I need to invest in the tooling and the organization and the optimization early on. What I saw from a lot of the other top people is they they invested in actually working with the L5 kit more than I did. And they would do various different optimizations to make it load the data faster or do something else for them. Um, and I started looking at that late into the competition, but it would have been a lot better if I did it very early on because that compounds across all of the different experiments that I was doing in the future um, and could have saved me um, compute time basically by, by iterating faster. Um, so that's all I have in terms of presentation. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for me or wants to discuss anything. I know that we have other people who competed on this. It would be great if we could hear maybe some of the things that you guys tried out and how you came to those conclusions. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions or ideas in that regard, feel free to speak up now. Um, yeah, I, I see it. Did I use any systems to keep track of submissions and results? Um, so not really. I can kind of show what I did. I basically had a um, logs folder, and I just had all my various different models. And then I just kind of kept track of various different things, and I just wrote them to log files. And then looking at the loss, I could just see here's the time of the of when it started training and then here's the various different losses. And that's kind of how I kept track of the performance of all of my stuff. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of my organization system. And then I would also just kind of cross reference and look on Kaggle and say, okay, this one did 16 or 15 or something like that. Um, but in general, I could just look at these numbers and see um, how things were performing. Um, what was my point on the training and validation tracking on my last slide? Um, so one of the big things with this competition was um, the amount of history and the amount of future that was available to us basically. And so in the training data, um, the way it was prepared, it might filter out certain values if there was not enough history available or not enough future available. And making sure that it was um, the same between training and validation was very important because if you train a model that's optimized only to predict 
five steps into the future versus 50 steps into the future, that can end up with a very different um, kind of trade-offs it, it values. So were there other people who um, participated in Lyft? Did you have any, um, any questions or any comments on like things that maybe you were really hopeful would, would help whether or not they actually ended up panning out? I, I did the Lyft competition as well, but I don't know if there's, I mean, how many are on the, on the call here that uh, there, there may be others that have more inter interesting insights than I do. So I don't want to um, wrap it on for ages, but um, okay. So if, if I'm like interested to on, you know, a lot of actually Ryan, what a lot of what we did was very, very similar. And I think there was probably only to like that one particular area that you identified of just not training long enough. Um, and the second thing was uh, like the two biggest drivers in this competition for me. So I was on a team, we finished up sixth overall, but the biggest driver of the whole thing was actually just how we sampled the data and how much of it we got through. Um, and, and I feel like if you, if, um, those two important pieces of the puzzle, if you just, and they're quite simple ones, I feel like everything else that you had done was like bang in line. Um, and, and actually just dealing with those two particular parts would have probably got you right up to the top of the leaderboard. Um, mm. uh, so there was a couple of things that I, I did very early on. Um, s similar to Ryan, I, I had a, a quite a, a resource constraints, constrained setup in that I was working off 1080 TIs um, and I had, uh, you know, dual, 10 dual cores, um, which was fine, but, but not amazing. Stuff was taking ages to run. So one of the first things I did was try and condense the information that we had. So for example, if you're looking at a history of 10 frames, um, that would come out as a history. You'd have 10 channels for your history for the ego vehicle um, plus the current frame. 10 for the history of all the agents in the scene, plus the current frame. And then you've got your three channels for your semantic map. So what I, I had done was condense those into sum all the histories together so that you, you, you get a kind of a density function of where it was over time, have the current, sum all the histories of the uh, ego, have the current. And then actually I ended up sum, summing the semantic map as well, which was interesting because it me meant that red and green in terms of the traffic lights, uh, red and green ended up being the same, right? But, but what I had found was that actually only yellow gave you any information that wasn't already contained in the vehicle movement. So that was the important piece of the puzzle to keep. So I ended up with like a five channel model that stick, regardless of what history of frames I went with, it always was a five channel model, um, uh, which probably helped me to just speed up the tra training and actually allowed me to have a bigger batch, batch size on limited GPUs. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I did a really small raster size. I actually had a, a, one of the models that had a raster size of just 128 with five channels using a history for uh, only five frames of history. Cause again, I was just so time constrained that I could, you know, couldn't deal with anything bigger than that, but it got to about 11 or so. Um, so you could, you could do very, very well with very limited information. And I wonder what people thought about this. I like wonder about how much was it actually learning from the specifics of the roads it was taking and the fact that we were only ever looking at this very, you know, um, limited number of routes. Um, because I felt, okay, how could something that tiny come up with something that does, you know, reasonably well? Um, so, so that's what I had, you know, kind of, uh, uh, comes to the conclusion it must be something to do with familiar routes and the other thing was like getting stuck into the L5 kit what I did was I ended up trained at the other key point which was I just trained on chopped versions so I, I knew that the test set was a chopped version of the um, of the training data so I just replicated that in the training data also I, there was no way I was going to get through the full amount of training data it was just far too big for me and um, so I replicated by chopping the data set um, and also 
got into the bowels of the L5 kit and changed it so that I was only doing very light. So for example, if I was chopping at the hundredth frame, typically what it would, did was take all hundred previous prior frames, but I knew I was only using five or 10 of them. So I just chop at 10 frames. So I ended up with a lot, you know, a quite a lightweight version of the chop data set that I was going to iterate through. Um, the other thing, one thing that was actually interesting that came up was the question of scene diversity, right? So I did a, did a, an experiment earlier on, which was looking at, and this was way before I even got to the full da data set. It was just looking at the, 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 the sample data set and it said, okay, what if you train random uh, indices from this data set versus what if you train ensuring that you draw, draw one index from each scene of the entire data set before you move on. And there was a really big difference in performance. So that's it. okay, well, there's something important in terms of how we feed the information into this model when it's training. And, and, and having this diversity in scenes seemed to, be, seemed to be important. And I wondered if that was actually down to a diversity in drivers. Like if you think about this as something like, a, a, you know, a, how you would do class balance in a regular problem. So you have an undersound, you know, an, you know, you want to actually balance the classes while you're training in order that your mother model learns accurately and in a sensible fashion. And I wondered if what we were doing, in fact, it was performing well because we were saying, okay, have a diversity in drivers. Because really what you're trying to predict is the accelerate, like what was killing you in all of this was the acceleration. Like it was cases of acceleration. That was you're trying to, because when the models, when you looked at the modes, it generally is predicting a trajectory quite well. The question is how far along does that trajectory is the vehicle going to get? Um, so I think, and a lot of that is, um, yeah, some of it, if it's clear roads, it's down to different drivers, right? So, so maybe something, I mean, I don't have any definitive proof or kind of speculation here, um, but something around the driver diversity could have been important. Um, and then I think the only other thing I did differently at the, at the end was the ensembling, which was a tricky one. As, and I think a lot of the assembling that did really well involved, you know, having to stack models um, and learn from a bunch of trajectories what, what it should take as its top three. And um, what I ended up doing was distance already, because I could see that uh, the model is typically trying to predict how far it's going to get. Like its trajectory is stable, but how far along that trajectory it gets. So if you distance ordered, you have a load of diverse models and you just order them in terms of distance covered that when you, you could just do a straight average then and it got you pretty good results. Um, anyway, we could wrap it on about this for ages, but I don't know what's useful for other people to <laughs> hear about or discuss. You, you mentioned that you thought that the, the sampling was important. What, what was the thing, what was the full setup that you thought yielded you the best result? Um, so if I was doing this over from scratch, I'd actually do it different. I think you get a lot better result what i ended up doing was chopping the data sets right that was super super important um and then i and i and i trained with a bunch of chopped data sets as many as i could manage within on my machine which was like 16 on my machine at maxed out i know it started getting having problems with ram etc um, but really what i should have done from the start was get into the l5 just have the train full right go through the chopping code, but instead of actually chopping and physically saving off those data sets, just save off the indices. Mm -hmm. And so then you have the indices of exactly what you need to chop lined up with your whole training data set. And you just load that one and you just keep going as long as you can. You never get to have to show, because I ended up having to show the same scene, like the same um, mm -hmm. agents numbers of times, because I was limited. But I think if you were starting over, you just do that at the start and just train it as long as you like. And actually you get a much better result that way. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that was the key in terms of ensuring doing two things: mirroring test setup with training, and then ensuring scene diversity as you were training. How how long did the did the chopping process end up taking for you once you did that sort of um, shorter well, history? Because for me, it took an hour and a half or two or something like that. Yeah. So once you made it, once you actually shortened the history, you could do, well your machine's probably a lot quicker than mine. So it was taking me like an hour and a half or two with a shorter history, right? So I was a lot slower than that. But yeah. I also found that um, like, and also if you, if my machine was a bit better, I had, I had it set up so that I could actually run it in parallel. So I could chop uh, to, like two or three data sets at a time 
But then it was just, I think the czar part of it, does that actually incorporate some sort of multi-threading? Because it seemed that even when I was chopping one, it was using all the threads available. So I figured, well, actually, if I'm loading a load of these side by side, it's my machine isn't going to go any faster anyway. Um, but it did, it made a significant difference, but it sounds like my lightweight version was still only as fast as your full version. I, I don't remember the exact timing. That might have been my timing for the train file and not the train full. I don't remember it. It might have yeah. been eight hours or something like that. I don't I don't remember if I ran. Yeah, it was a lot. But when you when you when you confined it just to the previous 10 frames or whatever, then it was mm -hmm. it was much quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ciara, can I ask you mentioned diversity. Did you do anything uh, to seek out hard examples? Um. Yeah, we looked at this a lot, actually. Um, yeah, so I, I did mention that. Sorry. So one of the things that I was doing was uh, I was pulling out, I exposed. So the, within the L5 kit, you didn't have, you know, at the, at the beginning, you, the, it didn't expose the frame. I think you could say the scene, the scene index, the frame index, it got those on the fly. So I created just a version that exposed those. So I could see within each scene how many... Um, or oh, within each frame, sorry, how many agents were in that frame? Because what I was looking for is like, okay, when we've got 40 agents in the frame, this is gridlocked, right? These these cars aren't moving anywhere, right? They're, they're just sitting there. And, 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 and what's more, if we're gonna sample all of those 40, because each of those 40 agents are in the sample, right? We're gonna wait, our model is gonna see those, that setup without any movement uh, way more frequently than it would a free moving um scene with just one so yeah so i did i did a, a, basically sampled based on the number of, of agents in a frame so where um i undersampled um in it worked out up to about seven agents in a frame just keep them as they are and thereafter you sample uh sample around each iteration i just sampled a, a proportion um and i found optimal was around a half life by about 14 agents. So at the stage where there's 14 agents, I'm sampling 50% of them. Um, and it was just like num one over the number of agents. I mean, that was waiting. It was very, very simple. But yeah, I was um, implementing that as well. I mean, that, that made a bit of a difference, but it wasn't like groundbreaking difference, like maybe half a point or something. But it did make it converge more quickly, I think. So it probably had a bigger impact if you were only training for 24 hours as opposed to you were, you were doing a really, really long training. I can think of more questions, but, but anybody else have uh, comments about the competition or, or questions for either uh, Sierra or Ryan? All right, I'm gonna ask another one. So, so, oh wait, Sophia, were you um, gonna ask a question? Hi, yep. Um, hey everyone. Uh, so um, I'm just, uh, I was also participating in lift motion prediction and there is one interesting thing that seemed a bit counterintuitive to me. Uh, have you noticed that larger uh, raster sizes with smaller pixel sizes just tend to work worse? Um, so they result just in a larger loss. Uh, if you notice that as well in your models, why do you think that is? Um, I wonder if that you go on. You you start, Ryan. I so I actually did some experiments where I said, so I my my base model was one twenty eight by one twenty eight, and then I I think the raster size was whatever the default is. I think it's point one meters or half a meter or something like that. Um, and then I tried a corresponding experiment where I just doubled it. So I said 256 by 256. And then I, um, I, whatever direction it is to make it basically equivalent, but double the size. Um, and I ended up not really seeing very much difference between those. I saw that it seemed to converge more slowly, um, but it was kind of hard for me to gauge per amount of samples, because the way that I was running things, I was doing it based on time. So I would say basically every hour do validation and then write some logs down. So I couldn't necessarily say apples to apples, how many samples it was taking in order to make a certain amount of convergence, but it seemed like they were roughly converging to the same 
um, point. But I know that there was also some filtering that was going on where if something's below a certain size, it just essentially gets filtered out. So that, that might have had some bearing on it where a smaller pixel size might have ended up um, surfacing certain objects that were very small and not really relevant. And it might have hurt things potentially. I'm not sure. That's just a guess, though. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what was happening. And also, um, I was also kind of impatient with training. Uh, for most part, I was training on about 25% uh, of total samples and then just shutting it off and seeing what the score is. And that's pretty much how I did this entire competition, which hurt me a lot. Like, I agree with you on that one. So when I ran the raster size experiments with that kind of um, technique, I guess, I noticed just the larger raster sizes with the smaller pixel sizers, the sizes work way worse. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I kind of attributed it to it pretty much uh, uh, seeing more agents that might be irrelevant to actual vehicle motion, but I was just wondering, maybe you guys found something different. Yeah, that that's my best guess. I don't I don't really have any stronger intuition there. Also, another kind of going back to the discussion about the backbones. Uh, so Ryan, you said you experimented, like you did limited experiments with backbones and didn't find much improvement. Yet I'm seeing in recent discussions on the forums uh, that some people found like significant improvements from using certain nets, well, certain backbones. Um, also maybe Chiara has an input in that, like, oh, you know, what was your experience with it? I was using ResNet 8, again, back to my limited resources. I was using ResNet 18 pretty much for the whole thing. Um, but one of my teammates, writers was using a ResNest 50. And he was definitely getting better scores with that. So I then transferred to using that. And it gave me about a point improvement. Um, so definitely, like, you know, you know, a worthwhile improvement from doing that. Um, and I think didn't the first team they were using like a fishnet B3 and B B6, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. And those are much bigger models. Yeah, much bigger yeah. models. I think On there the was team. scope for yeah. Mm -hmm. But but even but I think then like the team who was like one or two behind us, um, they were ResNet 18. I like if you trained your model, if you did the, they, but they did the chopped data set thing and mm -hmm. they trained their model for a long time. Like that seems to be like they were two of the biggest drivers. So if you did that, you could have got away with using a much simpler backbone. But I presume in their case, if they had actually used a bigger back, backbone, they could have improved again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I also found the discussion about batch size interesting. Uh, Ryan, you might remember that one, <laughs> uh, where one of the competitors used batch size of 500, over 500 and just trained for a long time. And he got into like the top 10. And to me, that was just kind of um, interesting how in this data set, it actually was more valuable to just get through more information at once. And I think just a lot of us were being extremely impatient and just kind of testing ideas. Like I tried half of what Ryan tried, but lots of similar things and just nothing worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of, one of the things that I was toying with was, um, if you, if you have smaller batches, then you're taking more steps. So I thought maybe that means I'm going to improve more quickly. Um, but it seems like it was the case that larger batch size made it so you could get to a smoother, more, more better optima eventually. Because when I tried having my batch size, it made it so it just was not even converging to, to a similar scenario at all. Um, right. And so I ended up sticking with batch size of 32, but then on top of that, I had two GPUs. So that meant actually each one was only getting 16. And so I think even then I was kind of flirting with some instability. Um, in my I used, I used 256 actually, but funnily yeah. enough, I had three GPUs, okay? So if, if I, I, was, I was running into, I figured a batch, I, I, I wonder if that's down to batch norm because mm -hmm. definitely when I was, um, anything lower than that, and, and I didn't know it was because I had such a small raster size as well, um, but 
I was getting NANs in my loss. So I had to increase the batch size to 256 so that it was even stable. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think you're right. It, it just wasn't, like it was a much smoother convergence with the biggest batch size. And I wonder, was that batch norm related? I, I think that's part of it. But I also think that part of the issue is you would have a batch where um, at least early on, you would have one where it's like, wow, every single sample in that was fairly good. It got a loss of like 20 or something like that. And then you would have another batch where it was like, okay, that, that one was terrible. It got 5,000 on average for that batch. And I think that that kind of led to some instability. And I think that's where the bigger batch size kind of smoothed that out a little bit. So you would have more consistent losses throughout the batches and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think big batch size helped in some regard there. Um, I, I took a different approach rather than increasing the batch size. I just said at the beginning when the training is very unstable, I'm just going to do a very small learning rate. Um, so I would start with one, um, one e to the negative five and one e to the fourth would get me to a better solution faster, but it would be unstable sometimes. So I just defaulted to one e to the negative five. Uh, but may, maybe the better solution would have been to increase the batch size. Ryan, yeah. quickly, did you did you then increase your learning rate a little bit after warm up, or did you just leave it really small? I just left it small, basically. Um, it it seemed to also depend on the model that I was utilizing. So sometimes I would say, okay, I'm going to give this one four restarts on one e to the negative four. And it would just be unstable every time. And then I would switch to negative five and then it would be fine. Um, but then other models would be perfectly fine with, with one even negative four. So it seemed to be a little bit model dependent. It might've been batch norm. That, that, that is a potential explanation for that. CR, did you play around with um, learning rate or, um, or optimizer? Um... Not really, not a huge amount. Well, we did get it. Okay, so only realized very late in the game just how important training for an incredibly long time was. Um, so I did, you know, we'd, you know, I had long runs. I was doing playing around with raster sizes one two eight and one nine six, and I had a long run finished to one two eight, moved on to one nine six, and that was, you know, set off for its five day run or whatever it was. And I had access at that point for the last couple of days to another machine, but it wasn't long enough to, 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 to train from scratch. So I tried to, I said, okay, well, I'll just fine tune the, the one to eight model, but I've been using fit one cycle to train it originally. And it just seemed like getting the parameters right to get it to start learning again from where it was, was really, really difficult. So I did play around with kind of learning rates and everything at that point. Um, uh, and a lot of the time, I, again, I was running into NANs, I was running, you know, all kinds of stuff. And it just was going, it wasn't converging at all from where it was. And um, I think part of that was, and I don't know, this is a question for other people in general. I hadn't ever fit a model trained with fit one cycle before. I had never fine tuned it again. And it seemed that um, one of my teammates, right, right, did have success in doing it, but it took so long. So it looked initially like it wasn't getting it. It started off where it was, and then it just started disimproving. And so it took so long to kind of get out of its local minimum before it started learning again, that I think I just cut mine off too soon. I think I was just saying it's not gonna work because it literally took him two days for it to get out of the local minimum and start converging again. So I, th I think if you're impatient at all in that time, you're, or time is running out, you're like, okay, quit it. I got to try something else. Um, mm -hmm. so maybe it would have, but yeah, that was the only playing I did was at the very, very end. And I don't think they were really reliable experiments because I was just trying so many things at that point, just to, you know, eke out any little bit that I could. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I played around with learning rates and batch size also due to exploding gradients or the NANs that everyone was getting, confidences should sum up to one, you guys probably know. Uh, yeah, before that, I just honestly didn't even think it's gonna be that important. Well, apparently it was, so <laughs> yeah. I, I tried cyclic learning rate. Um, so just kind of increasing and decreasing on a, on a certain cycle, um, going from one E to the four, one E to the negative fourth, through 1e e to the negative sixth. 
Um, and I didn't, I didn't really see any benefit to doing that. It seemed like just doing my, my static atom at one e to the negative fifth was doing fine. I know that um, I've had some conversation with Pascal and Christoph and, and Philip from the first place team. And they seem to think that um, just vanilla SGD with momentum tends to be better on, on image problems. So maybe I should have tried that at some point. Um, but I was, I was reasonably happy with my optimization. Um, did, did any of you try transferring resolution? So I, I had certain experiments where I said, I'm going to start with 128 by 128, and then I'm going to add on and do 196 or 256 or something like that after. Um, and I was really surprised to find that it just completely broke down. It was basically the same as just starting from scratch. So I would train a model at 128, I would get it to convergence, or at least what I thought was convergence at the time. And then I would say, now I'm going to double its context. And then all of a sudden it would just, its error would be completely wrong. It, it would have to basically start entirely from scratch. So whatever the CNN was doing was very dependent on the resolution in some way. I saw your chat on that actually. I didn't have the same experience in that um, well, the one I did was 128 to 196, um, and it, it converged way more quickly. I mean, it didn't start where it was, but, mm -hmm. but it did, it definitely sped up convergence. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if it was a jump from 128 to 256 that was just too great. Maybe, maybe the magnitude of the change. Mm -hmm. That was in, in one of my kernels, I, I was kind of exploring that. So I had it train on a very simple task, just trying to measure the, the, the distance between two points. And then I was trying to say, okay, what happens if I expand this out to 128 and, and 196 and, and so on. And I did various studies of that. And I found that there does seem to be sort of an effective range for if you're at 128, you can go a little bit smaller and a little bit bigger, but you can't go way bigger because it's just not going to be able to um, output that range of numbers. So maybe it was, I just made too large of a difference, but um, I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was interesting because you think that the CNN should be able to just look at the local patterns and be able to derive the same thing out of it, but actually the bigger images for whatever reason made it degrade to the point that it was basically like starting from scratch. Might have had something to do with the fact that um, it was seeing agents or objects that were previously filtered pretty much. Mm -hmm. And it kind of would probably confuse over that. But I don't know. For me, bigger images just didn't perform well at all. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, one of one of my co-workers Olivier mentioned that he was using um, 338 by 338 images which I just can't imagine doing that that would be so slow I don't I don't think it would give any benefit either but um, I don't know maybe maybe there was something to that if you train long enough I mean I tried the whole with height concept remember like from one of the discussions with increasing the width and decreasing the height I mean, that was pretty bad. I mean, intuitively, I thought it would be bad because it kind of cuts off half of the image. Like if you actually visualize all the scenes, um, it would cut off, uh, cut off way too much information. Uh, so the bad result made sense. But then I tried uh, shifting the ego center uh, so it would actually fit on the image. Uh, that was also a bad idea. That is kind of strange to me, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. I, I also did some models that was 128 by 224, so it was wider, so I had further forward context because I did see that some of my samples, the trajectory was going off of the image, um, but I didn't really see any return from that. It didn't seem to be useful in any way. Did you try moving the ego center at all, or was that also? Um, at, at one point, I tried completely centering it, so setting it to 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, but I, I don't think I even trained that one long enough to really have any result for it. I did as an augmentation. I, I did ran, random e ego center augmentation type thing mm -hmm. and it didn't make any difference. Yeah, yeah.
So are, are either of you planning on a new competition or are you burnt out from this one? Um, Kiara, you want to start? <laughs> um, I was looking, the debate is now whether you take on something just before Christmas or not. Like, do I really want to be? Uh, no, I think I probably will, but I don't know. I was looking at the NFL one, the helmet, um, I can't remember the name of the title. The impact. Attack. We know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent all of yesterday building a pipeline for that, and then someone posted a public kernel that does better than this solution I worked all of yesterday on. So oh, that's so frustrating. <laughs> that's what I get for starting the competition early, though. That's kind of just how it goes. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know it. At least you know. You know I mean, you know your pipeline now. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. I don't know. It's kind of crushing to spend a whole day working on something and then go, oh, now everyone who just started just copies this and is ahead of me now. Um, but I'm used to it at this point. I've been doing Kaga long enough. It, that seems like it's it's finishing just a, in a month or something. Is that it's right? It's very like, short. I'm, it's I'm, great for an image one and like this is super short. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm surprised it's so short. Yeah, the, the, the hub map one is a little bit longer. That one's super short for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the competitions, um, I was going to join another one like straight away, but I think um, so. My story kind of like background I started machine learning this summer and I have not actually started learning deep learning. I just went into this competition, you know. So, a reasonable thing for me would probably be to actually do a course in deep learning, you know, to well, actually officially do that and then continue with competitions. So like, I'm really tempted to join another one, but I think I need to, you know, <laughs> calm down and actually learn yeah. some stuff. Okay. What's your background, Sophia? Sorry? What's your background? So I'm an aerospace engineer, uh, a stress engineer. Um, currently work at Airbus um, Center in Russia. So um, mechanical engineering is my background. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, of course, I always knew how to code. It was kind of always in my life, you know, but um, later I just uh, realized the change needs to be made and I found data science and um, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you think that it's been an easier transition for you to pick up data science after you studied mechanical engineering? I always wonder um, people's skills transfer over. So um, if we're going to be honest, my current like job, actual job skill set has nothing to do with machine learning. Mm. So zero, I'm going to, I'm pretty much going in from scratch, you know, as if I have no experience, but um, like this technical background and just going through technical college, it teaches you to like grasp a lot of new unknown information in a short amount of time. And because of that, like data science and machine learning was no different. You know, I was just uh, able to, with motivation and interest, of course, just quick, quickly learn it and apply it. So, you know, if a person is kind of already from a technical background and has motivation, I think it's not that hard, you know, mm -hmm. unless they're the type of person who just doesn't like to code and, you know, doesn't want to go anywhere near it in this day and age, I think that's not a very, you know, great thing hmm. kind of imposing yourself. So, yeah. Do you mind if I ask, did you at least do some kind of coding as part of your, your MAE work? So, um, kind of, um, mainly when we, because I'm a stress engineer right now, we work with a lot of data again. Well, not data, but like results. Yeah. And they're all in a very messy format. And uh, often I have to write scripts to kind of click a button and make a nice table out of it. So that's kind of as far as it goes. But ever since the whole coronavirus deal, let's say, uh, we've been in <laughs> quarantine, I kind of uh, dived deep into learning Python at first. Then I found out about machine learning. I went into a machine learning course and I was in. Like that's kind of... Um, uh, I wouldn't say really that my job helped me with it. You know, my job kind of just touched on it a little bit, but not really. 
Yeah, my my background, I have a degree in business, which is, I think, even further removed. And so a lot of when I was first starting off, even just the linear algebra and the calculus and the, and the various different pieces of that, I was kind of playing catch up on. So I always wonder if someone who did a CS degree or, or various different forms of engineering might have a slightly easier transition than I did. Uh, but yeah, I, I can understand where you're coming from because I, I made that same kind of transition learning data science and machine learning. Yeah. What I noticed about CS degrees, by the way, is that they don't really directly set you up for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things that it's kind of like in engineering, you learn a lot of concepts from scratch, like how does everything work from scratch? But you go into industry and you don't do any of that. You just sit there and like, I know, write scripts and crunch, crunch numbers most of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a stress engineer. Um, same with computer science. They learn how to write a lot of algorithms from scratch. Well, they do learn data structures and algorithms, you know, and thing, the things that are practical. But what I noticed, they learn things that they will not actually apply in industry. And like their useful skill sets for industry were always obtained through their work outside of um, like academia, I guess, or academics in this case. Like I know if somebody here has a computer science degree, maybe you can argue with that, but this is something I noticed with my computer science friends and colleagues. Yeah, yeah my, my counter example to that is Philip from the first place team. He's one of my coworkers. He's got a PhD in computer science. And I always wonder if that gives him some slight edge in terms of the organization of his code and stuff like that. He might be slightly better at, at kind of setting things up to be modular and, and um, kind of look more system wide, uh, but hard to say. Yeah, so, in my so experience, what I've noticed from hiring a bunch of uh, computer science people, software engineers typically, is that the ones who are self-taught, who didn't go through a formal education, um, will often go down rabbit holes because they don't know that they're rabbit holes. That's pretty much to me been the biggest difference I've seen, where somebody who's gone through a formal education will know, oh, this is an unsolvable class of problems. There's just no point trying to solve this class of problems, right? Other than that, it really just comes down to the, those individuals, uh, how good they are at programming, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, that's been the biggest difference is people who don't have the formal knowledge don't necessarily know to avoid certain things. Now, that comes with a trade-off, and that is sometimes you are told at university that certain things can't be done or can't be solved, and then some kid decides that he's going to go off and try and do it and actually solves it, and then it changes everything, right? Um, so that's the trade-off there. But I've seen guys at Web Hired who are self-taught who try and solve problems where I just look at it for five seconds and go, nope, that's just unsolvable. You don't waste your time. Yeah, so, so my undergraduate degree was in computer science and I, I mostly agree with Sophia. I think that um, I actually appreciate uh, what I learned. And if I could actually make a little bit of a plug. So, so next week at this time, we're, we're starting the uh, Designing Data Intensive Applications book. And this book is not about coding. It's actually much bigger picture. And so I think that like a little bit what you're saying, Stephen, I think that um, what Sophia said, I learned how to learn things, you know, and I think I learned some of the bigger picture things like, hey, you know, you're going to have trouble if you're trying to do this, or, you know, if you have an application and you're doing this, you're going to have contention where all these different users are going to be hitting this resource, you're going to have a hot spot. And, and before you even get into any of the details, you can know, like, there are some warning signs. But um, definitely uh, some of the classes, they tried to teach some good practices in terms of naming, commenting, but almost all of my real organization skills, what little I have, that was on the job, a lot of other particulars. So, so, so Sophia, yeah, I would, I would second your comments. Yeah, and I would agree, Sophia. The, the thing that was most important about university was learning how to learn by far. Because the reality is, and so there was an interesting uh, lecture I saw a while ago. It's an old lecture that I saw a video of. And they went and looked at, for example, the field of statistics. And they looked at the people who had made, and this is a while ago, who had made the five largest contributions in the field of statistics. None of them had statistics backgrounds. 
So often what you're training and what you will contribute to are two different things. What about Chiara? What's your background then? Um, initially I did management science information systems, right? Which is just kind of a mashup between uh, business stats, a little bit of engineering, math and computer science, but for engineers as opposed to hardcore. And then I did a master's in applied statistics. And then I worked as a derivatives trader for a few years and then into consultancy, did a lot of predictive modeling, algorithmic trading, and then um, early stage uh, seed investing and um, related projects related to very kind of early stage startups and whatever else. Um, but I'm a, my family are farmers. We, we make cheese and charcuterie. And so I, uh, I also build traceability systems for food production. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, just a quick time check. Um, it's, it's two o'clock here in California. So this is the, I don't know, official uh, ending time. I, I wanna thank you guys for your generosity. Just thanks so much. I've really appreciated um, the conversation you sharing about what you've tried and also being willing to share all the things you tried that didn't work, right? Um, we're gonna stay on here uh, for anyone who wants to stay on, uh, but, but some people I know may have other plans. They, they may plan to leave. So um, just wanna give a chance to thank you all um, Typically in 15 minutes is when we start talking. And because there are a number of competitions that just ended, you know, we were really going to look at the NFL impact, NFL first one, you know, the, um, the hub map, the image one. And, and actually somebody on the Slack mentioned there is that algorithmic trading uh, competition that just, uh, just started up. But so, yeah, we were actually planning to talk um, in 15 minutes just about uh, uh, who wants to start up another competition now as opposed to maybe waiting until January after the holidays. So, um, so for people who do have to go, um, just wanted to get a chance to say thank you to you guys. Thank you for organizing this. It was nice to talk about this competition. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's better to have conversation with people who have been invested in it well, and especially because Ryan, you you decided to try going solo on this one. <laughs> I I really dislike doing that, but I have to. I don't know. I I just have the drive to get grandmaster, and I need to do a solo gold at some point. So um, I'll keep trying on that. I don't think I'm going to do solo for the next one though, because I'm just kind of burnt out on that. Maybe you can wait until after Christmas and, you know, have more energy. Yeah. You get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy the, I, I think the hardest part for me is just not having people to discuss with because I'll come up with some idea and sometimes it's good to have someone say, oh no, that won't work. Or, or maybe we do it in a slightly different way because you're going to run into X, Y, Z problem and just doing it myself. I, I have to learn everything the hard way. Even beyond that, I always find that actually just having the conversation, like a, having a conversation just sparks ideas. Mm -hmm. For me, I'll, I'll come up with a lot more, you know, ideas myself, but it through chatting with a bunch of other people and yeah. the team. Would, yeah. So now we typically take a break until 2.15, so like 10 minutes go to the bathroom, grab food or whatever. Um, and then we'll get back together and we'll discuss some competitions and stuff. Um, but I, I understand it's probably late for several of you. So if you need to drop off now, good time to do that. Um, but yeah, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes or so.